Hey everybody, Lars here. Time for the third and final video for Unit 5. Uh, this, if any video is a continuation, it's this video because we're going to jump right back to the code we did in video 2 and we're going to move forward. But this time, what is that? Is that my code? Yes. Um, as you can see, I left things just the same. It's a day later, but I left everything just the same up on my computer. Um, this video basically goes over five different things and they're all little tidbits and they're none of them are really big enough to do a whole video on but it really wraps up object orientation and, and does some extra stuff and you're going to see when we get to the end you're going to be like wow we did all that and we did and if you think about video time we will, we're going to do it all in less than an hour and you're going to have a pretty complicated setup like what we're about to do right now you see how i had class cat I'm just going to take it all, I'm going to copy it, okay, I'm going to come down here, I'm going to paste it, all right, so instead of class cat, I'm going to take my second copy, I'm going to make it class dog, I'm going to make the dog say woof, boom, all of a sudden now, we have a dog class, it was that simple, and that happens a lot, okay, the only thing we really had to change, because I'm going to add a color to it, I'm still going to inherit from animal and do all of those things but the only thing I had to do is I had to come down to my polymorphic method speak and make sure it said woof for my dog so now I can leave cat like that I guess but now I can say dog one and I'll make it equal to a dog equal to I'm going to assign it a dog and I'll make the dog's name Rex and Rex will be 35 pounds and Rex will be brown and then I can say dog2 and assign that a dog object and make this dog's name Fido. And Fido will be 45. I realized I didn't explain 50 pound cat to you. I will. Fido will be a red iris setter. And then what I will do is I will print cat. Let me do dog. You'll know why in a minute. Dog1 dot get name. Dog one dot get weight and dog one dot get color. Forgive me for all this. Get color. But like I've explained before, I think it's better for you to see me do the code. Alright, get color and I closed it. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy that. I'm gonna come down here, I'm gonna paste, I'm gonna paste. Oh, what happened with the paste? Come on, come on. Copy, paste. And then what I need to do is I just need to change the variables. So if I do a dog, then it's easy. Because I have another dog, and I just have to make a dog too. Here, I have to swap out the dog for cat. Did I hit the caps lock? Maybe not. Cat one, and cat one. All right. So now we have a dog object, okay, that inherits from animal, just like cat inherits from animal. And if you remember, we had class animal, and its constructor just holds two uh, instance variables, name and weight. And then we have getters and setters for name and weight. And then we have speak, which makes the animal say whatever it says. We left the pass there. We don't want it to do anything. We want it to be overridden, okay? And down here in our animal class, I mean in our cat class that inherits from animal, we just added a color variable and we made the speak method say meow because that's what a cat says okay with dog we've done the same thing we've added color okay we've inherited all the different stuff from animal and we're going to make our dog say wolf all right so now we're going to create three objects one's going to be a cat created with the cat class one is dog one created with the dog class and dog two with the dog class okay then we're going to just print out all of their instance variables and if this works we will get rex 35 fido 50 and felix the last one the cat is 50 pounds um a small digression off to the side i all whenever i do this video i always add a cat that's 50 pounds because a friend of mine a couple people at rutgers we have a theory and it's we call some of the people who work at rutgers are 50 pound cats and the reason we say that is because if you have a cat that weighs 50 pounds is it the cat's fault and yeah, it's not the cat's fault, it's the owner's fault for feeding the poor thing. 
all that food. The animal's going to eat what you put in front of it. So if you see a 50-pound cat, you've got a bad owner. you got a bad owner. A lot of people at Rutgers, employees that just go rogue or do weird things or this and that, we don't necessarily blame the employees. We blame their bosses because it's their bosses that let them get away with murder until year after year after year they just do weird stuff and then, render, then they're rendered useless after about three or four years. So we call these people 50-pound cats. Uh, it's a long story, and I'm not going to get into it in detail, obviously. But I always think, I just think it's a funny thing. 50 pound, I mean, if something is something and it's not their fault, it's the fault of the people who should be watching over them, you get a 50-pound cat, and we get a lot of 50-pound cats. So, no, it's not here anymore. I think I have it in the cave. We actually have a big, fat cat, and we wrote 50 pounds on the side of it. I digress, but it's a funny story, and I figured I'd put it in there. Um... If I seem tired or weird, it's because I'm on antibiotics. I have uh, this, uh, I don't even want to tell you because it's so bad. I have a cyst and it's not so bad that they're going to go in and cut and go get it. But they put me on antibiotics for a week hoping that it's going to get rid of the thing. And I'm just out of it right now. <laughs> totally out of it. I'm sitting at home. Uh, I got my TV fixed and I got my PS4 so I got some Diablo going. And... uh I'm watching my lectures on TV because I'm a nerd and that's what I do. Again, I don't think I ever did this for you guys. If you have Amazon Prime, great courses. Go to the great courses. It's seven bucks a month and you get all these different lecture series. I'm watching the, uh, the one on King Arthur. It's all about Arthurian studies and Dorsey Armstrong from Purdue does it and it's really good. It's fantastic, and it's, it's for nothing. Yeah, and the science ones are real great. You can learn about energy and particle physics and all kinds of stuff, and you don't have to sit in front of it like you're in school and absorb it. You just put it on in the background while you're going around doing the dishes or organizing stuff or whatever it is you do. While I sit here and web surf, I have it on in the background. It's fantastic. It's really good. All right, I digress. We've got to do some Python, huh? Be nice. So I ran this, and I have my objects and I have all of their data dumped right out. But, and we're gonna to get to the very first thing that we need to talk about. What if I wanted to keep track of how many objects I had? Like it's obvious in this small space we have here that I only have three objects. But what if I wanted to officially take care of it? Now, in our main code here under test it, we could set up a counter. And every time we created an object, we could click that counter. That's a good way to do it, but there's another way that we can do it, and we can use object orientation to do it. And the way we do it is by keeping what's called a class variable. Here's the dirty little secret. When you create an object with class animal for the first time, there's really two objects that get created. One is the instance, the instantiation, what we would have called in our instance dog or cat one, because that was the first one we created. But then there's another object that gets created that's for the class. And that one's called animal, okay? So when we do the cat, we're actually creating three objects. We're creating an object for the cat class, an object for the animal class, and the actual object here that's going to be pointed to by cat one. And what happens is these class objects keep track of things for every instantiation that they have and let them talk to each other and what I mean by that is you can have variables for the class and then any object that is created with that class can have access to those variables this is incredibly important down the line the example I always give is in a video game context because that's what I do I see you know yeah I have a hammer in my hand so I see nails but Let's say you had 20 enemies or 20 villains. I want them to be able to talk to each other to know where they are if they have to work together. Or I want to be able to keep track of how many I have and if I kill one, I want to get rid of it and I want to do things like that. So it's good to have variables that can be accessed by all the different instantiated objects from that particular class. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create what's called a class variable. Now you come up and I'm going to do it in animal so that way everything we're doing, which inherits from animal, will have access to it. Now, you see here in init, self.name, self.weight, we're doing this for an instance variable, a variable that only comes into play when you instantiate that particular object. I want something for the animal class now. 
So I'm going to come outside of the constructor and literally outside of all the methods. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create my variable. I'm going to call it a count and I'm going to set it equal to zero when I first create it. So when this class is run for the first time, literally when cat gets run, it's going to create a variable called a count. Okay. But what we want to do is have a count clicked every time we start something. So every time we create an object, we want to click a counter. So where do you think you would put such a thing? In the constructor. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to say a count and we're going to say a count uh, plus equals one because we want to click a counter. Okay. Now I'm going to run this code and it's going to blow up 50 ways from Sunday. Watch. Hey, hey, that's a good error too. I don't even have to look at it because I know that Python is telling me what's a count because I'm sitting here inside the constructor and it thinks it's a instance variable, but it doesn't have self in front of it. And, and what are we doing here? If you have a class variable, you know what the name of your class is because you're writing the class right now. You need to tell it. You need to tell Python what you're doing. Okay. You're saying this is a class. It's for the, it's a class variable for the class animal. So it's going to reside in that class. Now I want you to click it. Okay. So now when we rerun our code, we're back in business because I'm telling it that it's a class variable. All right. But we do, but <laughs> for our purposes, I'm going to say technically right now we have no way to access it. So what you want to do at your, in your base class, if you want to, and I'll put mine right here is you're going to write a getter. I'm going to call it get a count. Self. And it's just going to return uh, animal dot account. Okay. Uh, so now we have a getter. I'm not going to do a setter because the way we set it is with the constructor. Okay. I'm just going to let us access it. So return animal dot account. We should be good. Now what we want to do is come down here and just to test it, I'm going to say print. And then I'm going to say eh, from any one of our objects, I guess I'll do dog too. I'm going to say get a count. And I'm going to print it out. So now when I rerun, it tells me three. Okay. Now, if I take that print a count and I come up here and I do it after every time we create an object, we can watch it go greater. Now, if I run this code, it's going to blow up. And why is it going to blow up? Because I'm referencing dog two right here before I create it. So we have to make sure that we're referencing things by the objects that we have created already. So I'll say, I'll just make everything proper. Now, because all of these objects are created with the animal class, because they all inherit from animal, um, they all have access to that variable. And it's only one variable, and it gets increased every time we create one. So now when I run the code, you're going to see one, two, and then three after we create those. And there you go, one, two, three, as we created the variables. So now we know we can create a variable that all our different instances can access. And it lets you talk to different things. So it's really good. So now you have one instance out to the side that can generate something and write it to a class variable. Now all of the other instance variables can read that. Okay? In computer programming, we call that messaging. All right, messaging's been around for a long time and it lets the other things know what's going on. It's like home base. It's like a place up top where, every, where you can share information, okay? It, be, it gets very important for simple things like this. In my context, video games, I'm thinking about enemies. I'm thinking about how many enemies you have, you know, maybe a score for everybody in a, a particular class. That's what we wanna do. But it leads to a question. Uh, an obvious question at the end of the day. And it brings us to the second thing we're going to do in this video. I'm in a video game. Let's say I got 20 zombies or 20, you know, Nazi planes in the air. And I'm going to, I'm going to shoot one down. Okay. I just went from 20 to 19. How do we get rid of an object? 
It's not something you really do think about a lot, right? Because when you do your programs, you write your program, you create the object, you use it, and then the program ends. What if while the program is running, we want to get rid of something? We want to actually get rid of an object so it doesn't get looked at anymore. Well, we have a way to do that, okay? And it's using the DEL keyword. See how idle made it orange? And all you have to do is say DEL and then say what you want to get rid of. In this case, I guess because we have two of them already, I will get rid of Rex. So I say DEL dog one, all right? So now, after I do that, is it still in there? Look at that. And I can use dog two, which is good. So I'll get a count after I delete dog one, watch. All right, I have destroyed the object. Trust me on that because you'll throw an error. Let's see, dog one dot speak. You'll see there's an error when I try to run this because it doesn't exist anymore and I'm trying to run a method on it, okay? But when I print out the A count, and I'll do it again now that it's proper. When I do the A count, it's still three. That's because the variable was never decremented. We have to take care of that ourselves. And the way we do that is this. You see, I have the class animal, and I have right at the top a method that gets run when I create my object, okay? Self.name, self.wait, all that. On the complete opposite end of the spectrum, there is a method that you want to set up that runs when you destroy an object. If you're coming from C++ or Java, you know what I'm talking about. They're not really used a lot anymore because people, we're so lousy with memory that it's not really super important to destroy objects, but I, I, I always do it. You have your constructor and then you have your deconstructor, okay? So every class has a constructor and a deconstructor, which is the method that you want run when something is destroyed. Classically, and this is the way I was taught, so I always teach it, is your deconstructor is the last method. Okay, your constructor is first, and your deconstructor is last. And in Python, it's underscore del underscore. Well, no, dunder, del, dunder. Okay, two underscores, del, two underscores, so dunders. All right, and then I do self. And then what I'm going to do is print... An animal object has been destroyed. And then I'm going to go so far as to print out its name. I will say add to that self.name. All right, that'll work, right? Yeah, self.name is a string, and I'm going to concatenate it onto that literal. And then what do I want to do? What brought us here in the first place? I'm going to go to a count and I'm going to decrement it by one in the same vein as what we did in the constructor. If I ran that right now, it would blow up because I don't want to give it just a count. I want to tell it where to go. So animal a count deleted by one. So now, yes, I know how wonderful you are. I don't tell me what I have available. Now when I destroy an object, it's going to print an animal has been destroyed, the name of the object, and it's going to decrement a count. So now when I do a count, and I'll access it through dog one last time, because when we come back, I'll show you what else you can do. It's going to say two, because now we're going to do things properly, and we're going to decrement. Now when we run our del, it says an animal object has been destroyed, rex. Okay, so it's rex we got destroyed. My OCD demands a colon there. So now, you'll see that when we run it, it says an animal has been destroyed. Rex is the one because that was the first dog, and we've decremented our animal count, and our animal count is now two. All right, dirty little secret time. I'm always saying you got to make sure you use an object that exists. To, da, 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 you don't need it. If you want to, because we are using public access, and remember when, last video when I talked about encapsulization? You have public, protected, private, all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. Because we're using public and everything is out there, you as the programmer can go get it from wherever you want. So you don't even have to run a method. What you're going to do is you just want to print out the variable, and you have access to it that way. So now when you run it, you still get the two.
okay? Because you could just go directly and say, print the damn thing. Now, if you didn't have public access, then you would have to use a method and a getter and a setter that was provided for you by the previous programmers and a whole bunch of other stuff, but we have it just access. I'll leave it like that because you're gonna get this code eventually. Okay, so now if we wanted to, we could delete cat1 and then do the same thing and you'll see it'll go down. Oh, why did it do that? It'll go down again, okay? So we got rid of Rex and we got rid of Felix right now. We only have one animal. All right? One last thing. Well, there's really two last things, but there's one more thing I want to do. First of all, let's leave Felix. So I'll just get rid of that and I'll leave that as an example of deleting things. What's going to happen? So right now I got uh, Dog 2, which is Fido and Felix still around. Let's say I want to print their names or print their things or do whatever. What happens when I do that? Now we, we kinda went into this in the first video, I think, when we talked about self and what self really is. And self is just a memory location. And a lot of things in computer programming, when you get down to the nitty gritty, it doesn't, computers don't care about the name of the thing, our variables. We used to call them handles back in the day. Computers don't care. They wanna know where it starts because that's where that thing is. So basically everything's a memory location. Tell me where it is, boom. So when you print self, you get a memory location. Now, if I just print cat and think about it, all, the, all along as we've been learning Python, we print integers and it gives us the number. We print floats, it gives us the number. We print strings, it gives us the alphanumeric characters that make up those strings. We're asking for the data that that thing is pointing to. In this case, we're giving it a variable that holds an object. An object can have a lot of different data points. An object can have a lot of different things. Should we just dump it all? What would happen when you just print your object? And what you'll see is that Python kind of runs home to mama and just prints the memory address and just says, well, I don't know what you want, but whatever, but it's here. Okay, because that's all Python really knows. All right, we can change that though. And here's the behind the scenes. The print function in Python you're always printing an object because, little secret, int is an integer object, okay? Float is a floating point object. str, string, is a, is a string object. They're all objects. And every object has a little method that tells Python what to do when print is run on it, okay? And we're going to set that up. We're actually going to set it up in animal. And I always do it right above the deconstructor. And that is dunder str dunder, okay? Dunder str dunder returns a string. So what I'm gonna do is create a string, and I usually say data dump, and then I dump my data. So I will say data dump, and then I'm using a string, so I'm concatenating, and I'll say self.name, and then I will say I will cast it to a string because if I give it an integer, it'll blow up. Maybe I should run it that way and let you see. Wait. Okay. So I'm going to take self.wait. And is that correct? That is correct. That's okay. If I did not turn that into a string, it would blow up because you don't concatenate with numbers. You add with numbers. Okay. That sign has a different meaning with numbers than it does with strings. But that looks okay. So the last thing I want to do is return the thing. So return a string after I created it. So when this print gets run, it's gonna say, hey, what's cat1? Well, cat1 is a variable that holds a object that was created with the cat class. I'm going up to cat class. Do I have dunder string dunder? Hip hip bump ba da ba ba. I do not, but I inherited from animal. Come up to animal. Hey, do I have underscore string dunder? Beep, 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 doo, doo, doo. Yes, I do. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna create a string. It's gonna say data dump, and it's gonna dump some of the variables and then I'm gonna return it. Now, I don't do color because animal doesn't know what color is, okay? If you wanted to include all of them, then you would do dunder, string dunders for all of your classes, cat and dog. I'm just gonna do this simple example, so I'm gonna do it in what, in this instance, we'd call the base class, okay? We're gonna talk about real base classes <laughs> in a second. But, so now when I run this and I have print cat one, Instead of the memory address, it does what the function told it to do. It says data dump Felix 50. 
So I get Felix and his weight, okay? So anytime you wanna tell the print what to do with your object, you do what's called overriding the string method. And this is where I usually tell you the reels. I say overriding and you're like, what do you mean overriding? Animal's the base class, that's the bottom of the, of the, the line. It's you know, the first time it exists. And the answer to that is, no it's not. Every class that you write, every object that you have inherits base functionality from something called the super class, the class of all classes. It's basically a placeholder for all of the different things that classes can expect or do. There is a dunder init dunder there. There is a dunder del dunder there. There is a dunder string dunder there. Newsflash. There's a whole bunch of different thunders that we're not going to talk about because I'm not interested in, in scaring the hell out of you. Okay? You got a couple of them. You, later in your Python careers, you're going to run into some others when you do object orientation and stuff like that. They all come from what's called the super class. And every time you create a class, it inherits the base functionality that it has from that super class. So what we're doing here with our animal is we're overriding the super class init. We're overriding the super class string and we're overriding the super class del because we need to customize it. We need to tell it what to do for our particular thing. And that's kind of what you do when you do classes in a professional setting. You're going to know what the super class does. You're going to say, okay, I'm going to have to handle the constructor situation, the deconstructor situation, the string situation. You're going to have to handle, hey, if I sort this thing, how does it sort? Is it alphanumeric? Is it numbers? Is it this? Is it blah, blah. A lot of times you'll call that comparable. And how you, how you sort the object and how you do different things with the object. Okay? So you're going to, that's more complicated and that's for a more advanced class than what we're doing, but you can do all of that stuff. You can do a lot of different things when you set up your classes. For now, we're going to override the string function so that when we print things, it just prints things out. Concat I guess I can do the space in there. It prints things out and just does a data dump. Okay? So that's how you do that. Now you can control what prints when you use the print command and you print things. So if somebody is creating this code to give you as a library, they're going to set all that stuff up and then you just basically use the code. You're just like, oh, okay, let me instantiate that object and when I print it, what do I get? You're going to get all the data. All right. When object orientation is first coming around and people are, programmers really starting to use it, let's say 90s, mid 90s. I was a C++ programmer and I was doing stuff in the mid 90s. And what I did was I just did a data dump. What we call them state dumps. So you want to know the state of that object at that particular time. And some people would do like list all the methods, what it could do, when it was created, how it would do. You could go nuts if you wanted to. I just did a state dump because I figured, let, give me the state of the thing. If I've got an object and it's got five data points, and I don't, you don't have to tell me all the methods, just boom, tell me where it is data wise. Because usually that's a pretty good, that's a reasonable thing. Like if you're a human and you ask for the state, it's gonna give you temperature, blood, blood pressure, you know, the basics, your pulse ox, all of that stuff. Um, that's the state of things at the time. So that's what I would do. I would do data dumps, which is why I still call them, I mean, to this day, I still call them data dumps like I did down there. So basically, you're getting what the state of the object is. That's going to be different for every object. Okay? You know what? At the end of the day, if they wanted to, they could set something up where the default is printing all the instance variables. I've always wondered why that's not the case. But it's always left open for people to define and people to basically do the way they want to do it. Okay? Now I'm going to do one last thing to get this point across. And hopefully this blows your mind. Now, let me do that. All of this tested, this, that, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to take it. I'm going to highlight it. I'm going to copy it. And then I'm going to blow it away. Now I have my dog class, my cat class, my animal class. And look at this. I'm calling it my animal library because what I'm going to do is I'm going to save as, and you can see the code I have up here, and I'm going to call it Analib, or Animal Lib. Is that what I call it? I think I call it Animal Lib. Animal Lib. Just like that, with two L's in this particular case. So now I have Animal Lib with these classes. So then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say File, New File. I'm going to get a new file right here. It doesn't have to be too big, but you can want it where you could read it. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, uh, and I'm just going to say main animal code. I'm going to come down here, and paste it. Okay. So now I have all my classes off here in a library. And over here, I've got the main code. Now, if I not really tested it anymore because it's in the main. If I run this, is it going to work? No, it's going to explode. Well, let's do it. All right, I'm going to save. I'm going to call this Anna main. And Anna main, when I run it, it blows up because it says cat is not defined. You have to, where'd it go? You have to import from your library. So, I'm going to do something I don't want to do because I want the code to work. I'm going to say from animallib import animal, cat, and dog. And that's it. What does that look like? Unit 3, exactly what you think it looks like. It is just like importing functions from a library, except you're importing classes. It's the same thing. As a matter of fact, Part of the reason we go through what we go through here is so that I can get you to this point. Because in the future, when you're a Python programmer doing things for whatever data science or whatever task you're doing, this is what you're going to have. There's going to be a third party library or there's going to be a library out there that you need to use and it's going to be full of classes. It's not really going to be full of functions anymore. That's the way things were in the 80s and the 90s. All right. Things are more sophisticated now. Now when you get a library, it's full of classes and you're gonna instantiate the objects, okay? And then you're gonna run methods on those objects, which is why I always say to people, I have to do this unit because I would be a terrible, terrible Python guy if I sent you out into the real world and you didn't know about object orientation because everything is like this now, okay? You teach the basics of imperative programming. A lot of people teach the basics of imperative programming and say, okay, goodbye, see you later. And people go out to the real world and go, what's going on? You need to know a little bit about object orientation. You need to know the basics. You'll learn the hard, the other stuff as things go along. And you guys, you guys will be fine. I got no worries. But you need to see this stuff because that's what's out there right now. You're going to instantiate. Whenever you see things where you go dot whatever and then parentheses, that's classes. That's object orientation. You're running methods on objects. That's what you're doing in any other context where you, where you do it. Okay? So, and this is what's going on. We now created an animal class, and hold on, and if I'm not mistaken, sometimes I am, it is still blowing up. Why is it blowing up? Did I spell it wrong? Animal lib, oh, let me go get the original code. Uh, animal lib, it doesn't like the capital. Do, 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 do. I go right back to normal, and it does everything that we did before. You can see it up there. Okay, right there. So now I've imported my classes and then I can use them to do the work I need to do. Just like go back to our original example from video one, like if you had the bank account, then you could have your bank account code all in a library and just import it one line, just import it, and then you can create all your accounts and you know read in all the information. I mean, that's it at the end of the day. But you can see, we've been doing this for, what, I don't know, 20 minutes, 25 minutes? How long have we gone? That'll tell me. 34 minutes, which isn't bad for this video. Um, we did a lot of things. What we did, when I first came in here, I just cut and pasted cat and made it a dog. That happens a lot. You're gonna see that happens a lot. You can just instantly, I, if I wanted to, I could make it a cow, make it say moo. I could make it a, a pig and make it say oink or grunt or whatever. That, has, that happens a lot. So boom, all of a sudden we went from cat to dog. Then we learned about class variables where now you have a super variable that all of the instances created with that class can see. Then you learned about deconstructors. So now you can not only give your class instructions for when an object is created, you can give it instructions for what happens when it's destroyed. We're going to decrement a counter. We're going to print out that we're going away. Okay. Then you learned about dunder string dunder. That's what gets run with print functions. So you can tell your object to behave accordingly. If you just want to say, hey, I'm a cat object, you can do that. You don't have to dump any data. You can dump your data. You can do anything, you, anything your heart desires as long as it comes back in a string. Okay? 
And then what we did was we took all our classes, boom, and we put them in a library, modular, okay? Modularity, we compartmentalized. So now what you see in front of you does all of that stuff. It, it's just the main code because we imported all of our different classes and that's the way things are in the real world. That's what's gonna happen when you get out there and you start using third-party libraries and you start doing stuff. You're going to run methods on objects that you create by using the classes you inherited. Inheriting classes is just like inheriting functions. Same thing. Think about it. That's what you're doing. Only you've got a different kind of data structure there. I shouldn't say data structure because you're not there yet, but it's a different organization of your data. Basically, you're pairing your data and what you can do with your data to create an object or a context where you're only going to do that one thing. Class object orientation and the way we do things with classes is almost a way of modularizing things because you're not just running a method or a function willy-nilly on anything you give it. You're, you're doing it in the context of that class. Okay, It's taking your data, your attributes, and your methods or behaviors and putting them together to simulate an object. Okay, So it kind of makes sense after a while. Design-wise, it makes sense after a while. All right? I am now that we're done with the third video, I am going to put Animain and Animal Lib up in Sakai. <coughs> so you don't have to retype all of this stuff. You can grab this code and play around. Create a cow class. Okay? Play around with the dog class. Play around with different kinds of class variables. It's how we learn. Take this code and tinker with it and know that when you go out into the real world and you start using Python and doing things, this is kind of going to be what's going on. Okay? But you got to learn the basics, first three units that we do, then we learned a little bit about computer science. Now you're learning about the real, about what's really going on out there. All right? All right, good. So that's it for object orientation, at least this small Python introduction to it. Announcements. Tomorrow, the proposal is due for the final project. That said, if you run a day late and you give it to me on Monday, when I say give it to me, just have somebody in the group put it in their Dropbox and then send me an email saying, hey, this is whoever, the proposal for, for either Ravenclaw or Hufflepuff or whatever is in the Dropbox, okay? Easy. If it shows up on Monday, that's fine. I'm probably not going to look at them. I want, this is the one time where I do want to look at them quickly though because once I look at it, then I say approved, go then you don't, have any, you don't have to waste any time. Then you can get right to the design document and then start thinking about your code and your demonstration and all that stuff. That's the last time I approve anything too, by the way. Don't think when you send the design document you have to wait for approval there. Uh-uh. Once I approve the proposal, you're off. You're done. You don't need my approval anymore. You're fine to go to the end, all right? Um, so note that deadline. All right, because if you, you go an extra day with it, that's fine. But my warning to you is you're taking away a day of time that you need, you know, to do the rest of the assignment. That's all. Um, grading kit is looking over unit four grades this weekend. Hopefully I have begun grading the midterms. I promise you we'll have the results of both by the end of unit five. So no worries. You'll know where you stand and you'll know how everything is. Okay. Midterms do not make or break grades so don't get concerned over that um, other than that we are in fairly good shape I am going to release the assignment for this unit tomorrow and then this unit goes another two weeks pretty much until August 3rd all right but don't procrastinate because after you see the assignment it's gonna take some thought and it's gonna take a little bit of doing basically I can tell you now for those of you who don't know already um, unit 5's assignment is going to be, I'm going to ask you to write a class that mimics a deck of cards. And then I'm going to want you to take that deck of cards and play a game with it. A game called AC Doocy. So you'll get the assignment tomorrow. Probably tomorrow night. And then we'll move forward from there. It, it, when you see the assignment, at first you're going to go, I don't know how to do that. Huh? Don't worry about it. We realize we're throwing you into the deep end of the pool. I want you to think. I want you to start doing things. This is grad school. This is grad school at Rutgers. You're in the show. You got to start learning how to do things on your own. Okay? And that's, believe me, that's what this unit is all about. All right. I am going to get out of here. You are doing fine. You have no worries. This is going to be the last video. I look back at my old stuff. This is going to be the last unit five video. There's going to be one more video for unit six, and that's pretty much it on the video front. 
but you have all you need for the object orientation here. You have your slides, you have your Zell readings, and tomorrow night you're going to get your assignment, and then you're going to have, you know, I look down at my thing and I see July 21st, which means, what is July, 31 days? Including today, 11 days, and I know that the semester ends on the... 13th, I think, of August, you've got 20-something days left in this class, okay? We got to get to Unit 5's quiz, Unit 5's assignment, then you've got to do Unit 6 quiz, Unit 6 assignment, then you've got to do your final project. You've got a lot of stuff to do in the next 25, 26 days, so don't procrastinate is all I'm saying. Do a little bit every day. I tried to build the course so that if you do it for a half hour every day, you're good, all right? That's how I used to try to keep up with things. I used to say, I'm gonna, you know, when I do my work, I'm gonna take a half hour for every class at the end of the day and make sure I'm up to speed. So if I'm taking five classes, yeah, it's two, two and a half hours, but that's the way I did things. Uh, right now, if you spend a half hour doing stuff every day with this class, you should be good, okay? And I know you're gonna go long. Sometimes you need to catch up and do an hour, hour and a half. Sometimes you get into it and you're like, I don't wanna stop because I'm not gonna get back up to this point again easily, so I wanna crank. I get it, I know what the deal is. But this course is not made to binge. This course is not made to do it all in one night because it's a shitty way to learn, all right? All right, good, good, good. Then I'm gonna get out of here. Any questions, you put them in forums. Let me know what's going on and I'll be in touch, all right? All right, you be good. Talk to you later.